God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, God, that we can come together and worship, God, that we can worship you in spirit and in truth, that right now we can worship you freely and in peace, God, we take our blessings for granted many times. I'll ask you, Lord, to anoint me and to help me speak your word today. Holy Spirit, speak as we study the word. We don't just assume what's in it, but Lord, we're going to study and see what's in it. Lord, we thank you for that. We ask you to touch those here today at Fire and Grace Church, touch those watching and listening. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. We welcome everyone to Fire and Grace Church this morning. Um, we are now in part five of this uh, end time Bible prophecy series. Uh, of course, through several of the messages, when I spoke about the eclipse and the great sign, even last week, I've mentioned a few times about the rapture and what I believe about the rapture, what I believe that the scriptures teach about the rapture. Um, in fact, I think on the eclipse day, I went through... In the second part of that message, I went through some of the key reasons why I believe the Bible does not teach a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Now, I want to make this clear at the outset because I've already had somebody comment on Facebook about the term that, that we use called the rapture. Now, that term is not a biblical term. It's not in the Bible. It's made up by men. The reason I use it in the title of the message or when I talk about this subject is because... That's what most people understand. That's what most people have heard taught when you teach about the resurrection of the righteous dead and then we which are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord Jesus. Most people have heard that called the rapture. So sometimes I have to use terms I don't even like so that people will understand what I'm talking about. Okay? Um, but let's just say this, that the term rapture really should be called the first resurrection is what the Bible calls it. There are two resurrections in the last days. Two and only two mass resurrections. All right? And everybody needs to understand this. And they are separated by 1,000 years. The first resurrection is of the righteous. That, are, that means true believers in Jesus. True believers in Jesus that have truly been born again. That have made Jesus Lord of their lives. That have repented of sin. That are living for him. Now the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, and we're going to run through some of these very quick, but we're going to turn to a lot of scriptures this morning. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. Matter of fact, go ahead. We'll go ahead and start. You can put that up and just, uh, we'll come back to the second slide in just a second. But let's, let's get an understanding about this uh, because, of course, Whenever I mention the rapture, I get a lot of comments, YouTube comments, emails. It really starts stirring because, you know what, hey folks, this is an emotional, for some people this is an emotional uh, issue because they've been taught to believe that they're going to escape all the problems of the last days. Um, and so it's very emotional. And I'm going to say, especially for some, especially for some ladies, for you mommies out there, you, you, you want to think and believe that, you know, we're going to get out of here before anything gets really rough. And I understand where you're coming from. I have children, grown children, smaller children. Um, I would love to tell you that, oh, we're going we're, we're gonna to get out of here. We're not going to suffer any kind of persecution, tribulation, or difficulty. Or we're not going to actually see aspects of the wrath of God hit the earth. But I would be a false prophet and a false teacher if I told you that. Um, I, I thought about this as we were getting ready, as he's getting that, it's uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, huh? 13 through 18 is what we're going to look at first. But I was thinking about Jeremiah, in the days of Jeremiah, and I thought about, you know, Jeremiah started his ministry, God called him when he was a teenager. And I remember that so well because that's 
Jeremiah chapter 1 is what God used when he called me to the ministry when I was 19 years old. So I was a teenager as well. And I remember the Lord speaking to me and just coming in the room in, in great power. I felt his presence overwhelm me. I was in tears and he told me, he said, at 19 years old, he said, son, I've ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. And I said, Lord, I'm, I don't even understand what that means. I'm too young. I can't, I can't do, I, I couldn't even fathom what he was saying to me and, and neither could Jeremiah. But over the years, as God has uh, taught me and as I've learned things and as the ministry has unfolded over time, I often look back at Jeremiah's life and I see a lot of parallels in my own life because I see that how so many people, Jeremiah began prophesying as a teenager about the judgment of God that was coming upon Israel. And they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear it when he started talking about it. They didn't want to hear it in the middle of his years of ministry talking about it. And they especially didn't want to hear about it right before it was about to happen. They didn't want to hear it. And there were even prophets who would get up as Jeremiah would be prophesying that Nebuchadnezzar's coming. He's going to wipe this place out. Many of you are going to be killed. Many of you are going to be taken captive. They didn't want to hear it. And prophets would stand up and say, in the name of the Lord, in the name of Yahweh, oh no, Nebuchadnezzar's not going to come in here and do this. You're going to have peace and prosperity. God's going to deliver you from Nebuchadnezzar. And Jeremiah would say, you know, the false prophets promise you peace. Peace when there is no peace. I'm not going to be one of those. As a pastor today in this area is preaching a pre-tribulation rapture message today. He's going to give an account for giving false security and telling people they're going to have peace when they're about to have great tribulation. Um, Americans are some of the most deceived and some of the most spoiled people in the world. We need to understand tribulation has been coming and persecution and terrible things. Don't, you know, as, as somebody told me the other day, don't go to China and start preaching a pre-tribulation rapture. They will run you out of the country. The Christians will. <laughs> They say, you, you don't have any idea what we've lived through since 1949. Don't come here preaching that nonsense. But let's go through this this morning. Because when you start talking about this, when you start dashing people's brainwashing of indoctrination of many years, you know, there's that discomfort that comes. It's called that cognitive dissonance that comes into people's hearts and they go, you know, I just, I can't hear this. But let's look at it because the Bible does say that we are going to see at the coming of Jesus a mass resurrection of the righteous dead, those in Christ, those born again, those washed in the blood, those who have truly repented and made Jesus Lord of their lives. This is what he says. This is, uh, this is where we first kind of see this put forth uh, in the New Testament after Jesus in the Gospels. This is Paul. He says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. And he's talking about those that are dead. For if we believe, that means to rely on, trust in, cling to, true saving faith in Jesus Christ, that he died and rose again, even so them which also sleep or are dead in Jesus, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, as I said a few weeks ago, and we'll go ahead and jump to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, just to lay the foundation here. We were taught 
by traditional churches, Baptist churches, Assembly of God churches, we were taught by TV preachers for years and years and years, oh, better be ready. Jesus could come at any moment. The Bible never taught that. That has been a false teaching and anyone that's ever spewed it out of their mouths didn't know what they were talking about. Because 2 Thessalonians... Paul had to clear it up for them because he, he, he introduced this, this resurrection of the, of the dead in Christ and we which are alive at the coming of the Lord. He introduced this concept to them. Of course, Jesus taught it uh, right before in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, but here Paul's teaching it again, but all of a sudden there was confusion. So in 2 Thessalonians, he had to address the confusion. And what was the confusion over? The confusion was some were saying, oh, the coming of Christ has already happened. Or you missed it. You missed the resurrection. You missed the rapture. I mean, people were, were talking about all this. And Paul, so he, he's going to clear it up for you. He's going to say, you know what? That day is not coming until some things happen. Right? So here's what he said. And this is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Everybody pay attention. Let's pay attention to the wording. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now, what is that? The gathering together of the saints unto Jesus at his second coming is what is popularly called the rapture. It's true, it's, it should be biblically called the first resurrection. All right. He says, don't be soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, and notice the small s, he's talking about evil spirits, or by word, somebody talking, nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. What is he saying? Don't let anybody trouble you telling you that that day is near right now. Why didn't some out preachers to, in, in these days, does it? Paul said, hey, hey, hey. You're getting all worked up about the second coming. Not coming. Not near. Don't get worked up. The day of Christ. He's saying the day of Christ is at hand. Don't let anybody tell you the day of Christ is near. So for all those preterists out there who believe that it all happened at the end of the first century or the 70 AD, Paul would say, no, no, it's not near. And then he says this, let no man deceive you by any means. So he says, if anybody comes along saying, guess what? Jesus could come at any moment. There's nothing that has to be fulfilled for Jesus to come. He's deceiving you. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day. I love the word of God. Because the word of God is so clear. The coming of the Lord Jesus and our gathering to him is one day. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And then he goes on and says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So he tells us the man of sin, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, will have to come into a temple of God and declare himself to be God and to be authority. Now, according to end time Bible prophecy, the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, we know when that happens. Jesus even talked about it in Matthew 24. He said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, He's all, they're all referring to, Revelation 13, they're all referring to this time when there will be some kind of rebuilt temple. I know some people don't believe that, but I don't care. There's going to be some kind of rebuilt temple on the temple mount. It may be a tent. It may be a temporary structure. It may just be a little place of prayer that the Jews are allowed to have in the coming peace agreement that's going to happen. And it may just be, and, and listen, Jordanian Muslim clerics are talking about 
uh, and, and the Jordanians control the Temple Mount are talking about letting the Jews have a place of prayer, a little house of prayer on the Temple Mount. Muslim, clerics. It's going to happen. Bible prophecy is going to happen. Right. It, you don't have to. It's huge area. I've been up there. I've walked all around up there. There's plenty of room for a little place of prayer. They don't even have to have a big elaborate temple. So people are getting all worked up about that. But folks, according to Scripture, according to the book of Daniel, chapter 9, according to Revelation 13, according to these things, we get a, we get a time period of when the Antichrist is going to do these things. Even Matthew 24, where he, he kind of happens in the middle of the chapter, he's letting you know that this is going to happen in the middle. This is when the Antichrist breaks the covenant with Israel in the middle. And this is when he blasphemes the tabernacle. And this is when he declares himself to be God. And this is when he institutes the mark of the beast, which we're going to talk about in a few weeks. All right? So we know it's about the middle. So what I'm getting at here is Paul said, don't let anybody deceive you the day of the Lord, the coming of Jesus Christ, and our gathering together unto him will not happen until there is a great apostasy, a falling away that's evident, a falling away from truth, and the man of sin is fully revealed in the temple. All right? Is that clear? Has everybody got that? Okay. So, the Bible never taught Jesus could come at any moment. Never taught it. Now, we're going to go back to Matthew 24 because last week I talked about the birth pains, that I believe we, we are in the birth pains of the beginning of the Great Tribulation. I don't know, I don't know when the, seven, the final seven years is going to start. I don't have a date. I'm not predicting anything. We do have the great sign in about a week that's going to happen. But again, that's just a sign in the heavens. It doesn't give us a specific Date. Could it start on that day? Yes. Could it not? I don't know. It, again, the tribulation, y'all, could start with an uneventful day that nothing happens. Don't you, you understand that? It's, it's not about something happening on the day the great tribulation starts or it not happening. It's just, we, we may just walk right into it just like any other day. Probably the way it's going to be. That's what I think. Right? But Matthew 24, I want to show you this because we're going to go through this thoroughly. Now, of course, I call today the post-tribulation rapture and the great day of the Lord's wrath. Kevin, go ahead and put up slide two if you can, and then we'll, you can keep up with this, the scriptures there. But just know that we'll, we'll go to Matthew 24. But for those of you, and I hope, put, put this up if you can, make sure it's full screen for the viewers out there. But I can kind of walk some of you through. Now, I want to say this because I've never really taught this here, I don't believe. But I want you to understand, Jesus in Matthew 24, what's known as the Olivet Discourse, all right, when he was on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples asking, what will be the sign of your coming, the signs of your coming, the end of the world or the end of the age? He says there... Um, he begins to give an outline. Now, I've pointed this out many times. We know it is an outline that is chronological, that is sequential, because Jesus says, here, these things are going to start. You're, these are the beginning of sorrows. These are the birth pains. And then he uses the word, then this is going to happen. Then this is going to happen. Then this is going to happen. Okay? To the point you get to verse 29, and he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. So anybody with any kind of logical sense, right, can look at that and go, Jesus is giving us a chronological, sequential outline of the last days. Now, what I want to show you this morning is that Matthew 24, from beginning, from, well, from verse 3 to verse 31, is mirrored by Revelation 6, or the seals. I'm going to show you how they mirror each other. It's the same story. But before I show you that, all right, I want you to understand how the seals and the trumpets and the vials work according to Scripture, not according to traditional teaching, but according to Scripture, not according to denominations. All right? 
Now, the Bible never says when the seals would begin to be opened. I do believe that they were opened very early in the time of the early church. We do know where the seals finish. Okay? The seals finish at the second coming of Jesus Christ. I'm going to prove that. Now, the traditional teaching, as I've said this many times to you guys here at our church, I ought to know this. The traditional teaching says you're going to have the seven seals open. That's going to take you to a time period. Then you're going to have the seven trumpets. And then you're going to have the seven vials. That is impossible to have it that way. Why is it impossible? Because the sixth seal is where the sun goes dark, the moon does not give its light, the stars fall from heaven, and the wrath of the Lamb comes. And the nations mourn, and the mighty men and the rich men begin to hide themselves from the coming of Jesus. They see him coming and say, hide us from the great day of his wrath. So how could we be at the second coming of Jesus at the sixth seal and still have seven trumpets and, set, and, and the seven vials when the first vial is poured out right on people who took the mark of the beast pretty much right after the midpoint of the, when the tribulation, in the, in the tribulation. So we'll cover that in a second. So what I'm getting at here is, I've shared this many times, the seals are one story that lead us up to Armageddon, the second coming of Jesus Christ. The seven trumpets are another story, and these stories overlap. Again, it doesn't, the Bible doesn't tell us specifically when these would start. We, we pretty much know now, and I, I, I don't have time to get into it today, but I believe five of the seven trumpets have blown already. But they end, the sixth and seventh trumpet ends with Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus. The last trumpet, we'll deal with that in a second. The seven vials, they're the only ones we know for sure when they are because it says the first vial of wrath is sores come up upon the people who took the mark of the beast and people don't take the mark of the beast according to Revelation 13 until the Antichrist has 42 months to continue and 42 months is three and a half years so you're halfway through. So we know that this has to start around halfway through. But yet the sixth and seventh vial brings on Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus. So, I hope everybody understands, seven seals tell one story, like one gospel, but ends at the same time, but didn't start at the same time. The seven trumpets tell another story, but they end at the same spot. I'm going to prove this in a second. And the seven vials are the shorter story, but they tell one story of God's judgment, and they end here. Does everybody see that? This is the only way to understand the book of Revelation. If you don't get this, it's going to be a jumbled up mess to you. If you take the traditional teaching, seven seals, then seven trumpets, then seven vials, you don't have them where they overlap one another. It will not make sense. Can't do it. All right, now, let's look. We're going to flip back and forth. Everybody, I want you to flip with your Bibles. Kevin's going to do his best to keep up with me. But those of you in here, those watching, if you have your Bible, you need to keep up. I want to show you how this mirrors, because what we're talking about today is the post-tribulation rapture and the great day of God's wrath. Because a lot of people, all you know, here's what I was here. How many of you ever heard this? Oh, I know it's a pre-trib rapture, Pastor Dean, because uh, we're not appointed to wrath. I hear... I. I if I had a dollar for every time I heard that. All right. I understand we're not appointed to wrath, but you can't make the assumption based on your own understanding that that means we're out of here. Okay. I tell those same people all the time. When do we have in scripture another time God poured out very specific plagues to judge the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, his people were in that nation, three million. Did those three million Israelites leave Egypt before God's wrath or after God's wrath? It's simple deduction. It's simple Bible. 
We compare, you know, people talk about, you got to have discernment. Well, discerning people compare spiritual things with spiritual. Discerning people compare Bible with Bible, not assumptions with assumptions. Most of the things that we've believed, a lot of the things we've believed in church are just speculation and assumptions built upon preconceived beliefs that come from very bad teaching and bad hermeneutics. All right? So let's look at Matthew 24. Everybody knows Matthew 24. Now I'm going to run through them quick. Matthew 24, verses 3. We're going to run through this fast because I want to show you how they, how Matthew 24, Revelation 6 and 7 this, are mirrored. They're basically telling you the same story. They're giving you the same sequence of events, the same chronological order. So Jesus starts out, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Verse 3, right? When will these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus says, first thing he says is take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Right? Well, how do we see that mirrored in the seals? The first seal, go to Revelation 6.1. The first seal is the white horse with the rider who has a bow and a crown, and he goes forth conquering and to conquer. I've shared with you that these first four seals are evil spirits sent forth into the earth to bring about deception. The deception of the first horse, the white horse, the rider on the horse, is to conquer the world. And I believe they are represented by the Roman Catholic Church, the Jesuits, uh, the United Nations, the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, all these different groups, the Club of Rome, all these different groups that want to deceive the world that we need to create a world government, we need to, to create world peace, and it's deception. And that's where the false Christ, the false Messiah, the Antichrist, is going to come and take control of that. And so he's, he's basically, God's letting us know, the first thing you're going to deal with is this spirit that wants to conquer the world, this evil spirit, through deception, through claiming peace, through saying we need to unite the world. So you see that mirrored. So what's the second thing Jesus said? And we went through this last week, the, the birth pain. He said you will hear of what? Wars and rumors of wars. Well, if you're in Revelation 6, what do you see? The second horse, the red horse. He is what? He's known as the horse, the red horse of war. Why? Because he has a great sword and he takes peace from the earth. And I believe this is the spirit represented by communism, Nazism, fascism. And this spirit, this red spirit, is the spirit that takes peace from the earth. It says the red horse, and there went out another red horse, another horse that was red, and power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. That's war. Do you see how it's mirroring each other? What's the next thing Jesus said? He said there will be famine and what? Pestilence. Right? That's Matthew 24. What's it say in Revelation here? The black horse. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. He said, I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, or a denarii. And see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So right here he's telling you that the, the black horse is going to cause economic depression, food shortage, inflation, which will cause what? Famine. Do you see that? Jesus said pestilence and famine. The black horse. Shortage, food shortage. Food expensive. Okay? Right after that, if you look at Matthew 24, in verse 8, where he says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Look at verse 9. What does he say there in verse 9? He says, then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. That is martyrdom. 
That is a specific end time martyrdom he's talking about. Well, let's go back to Revelation 6. The fifth seal. What happens at the fifth seal? Revelation 6. I'll let Kevin catch up. I told him I'm going to go quick. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that had been slain, that were slain for the word of God and for their testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Now, hold on a second. Now, let me think about, think about this. We, we read over words, and we don't pay attention. These people that had just been killed, as the Bible says, their blood cries out to, from the ground, as the blood of Abel cried out. And he says here, how long, Lord, do you not avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Meaning the people that killed them are still alive on the earth. Meaning these were a recent wave of martyrs who are saying, how long, Lord, before you judge those wicked, evil people who killed us? And then what does he tell him? He says, white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest Yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now that's the fifth seal. Notice how it coincides with Matthew 24, 9. But let me tell you how it coincides also with the, uh, the rider on the, the green horse. So you know what I believe this is? This end time martyrdom. What did we see? What did we see in the world in 2014 and 15? We saw the rise, really 2013, we saw the rise of ISIS. And we saw the rise of this Islamic entity that began to kill, behead, torture, martyr, hang, crucify Christians throughout the Middle East, Syria, Iraq, to the point they said they, they have almost extinguished Christianity completely in those regions. I believe these are the martyrs who were saying, when are you going to judge these wicked people, God? And the Lord said, wait, there's, there's another wave of martyrdom coming. See, the fourth horse in Revelation, the fourth seal, happens to be right, right before the fifth seal is open. The fourth seal is the green horse, and green is the sacred color of Islam, and it says it has power over one quarter of the earth, and Islam is one quarter of the population of the world right now. So that spirit has control over one quarter of the earth. These, this is why I don't, I don't understand anybody that doubts the Bible, because it is so specific. And it foretold Islam 500 years before it ever came into existence. And it foretold not only its sacred color, but it foretold how many people it would have authority over in the end and that it would be part. It says death and hell is the rider of the green horse. Death is the rider. I had, I had an Iraqi Kurd who put in my cable a few years ago who was an interpreter for our forces in Iraq. And this is what this Iraqi Kurd told me about Muslims, Arab Muslims in Iraq. He said, they don't love anything except death. He said they don't love their own children. They don't love their own families. They love death. He said, Saddam Hussein killed my whole family. This is, this, I mean, you want to talk about an interesting conversation with a cable guy, right? But I already knew it. I've been to the Middle East. I knew it. But do you see how they're mirroring one another? Right? Now let's look at the sixth seal. What is the sixth seal in Revelation, and we're just going to read from the, the sixth seal all the way down to the end. All right, here's the sixth seal. I'm going to show you. We're going to go back to, to Matthew 24 right after this. Because the sixth seal, so we've saw, we saw the first seal is the white horse. 
going forth to conquer, deception, going to conquer the earth, lie through peace, create everything, world government. Then we saw the red horse that's going to bring war and take peace from the earth. Then we saw the black horse that's, after that's going to be economic destruction and famine. And then we see what? We see the green horse, which is Islam, turn loose. The fifth seal we see is the, the martyrs, right? The sixth seal in the book of Revelation is the second coming of Jesus. Or what happens just moments prior to it. Because here's what it says. And I beheld, and when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became his blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and every island moved out of their places. Remember this phrase right here, and every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. And then he says, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. That's why they've been spending. You know where all your money's been going, your tax money? Why we're trillions of dollars in debt? Because they've been building underground bases to save themselves. They're going to run to these underground bases. The Bible foretold this. And then they said, why? Why do they run it? It says, and they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now these are the Antichrist, wicked men of the world. Hide us from the face of him, meaning when the sky is peeled back and they see him. Folks, that's the second coming. Now I'm going to show you that this is the event. The, the sun going dark and the moon going dark and the stars falling. And the people saying, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. That doesn't happen multiple times. That happens one time at the second coming of Jesus. So let's go back to Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, he's gone through this whole list. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up and go through some of it in a minute, but I want you to see verse 29. Let's go to verse 29. He's not mentioned. We've read the whole chapter of Matthew 24. Jesus has yet to mention the rapture or the resurrection, the catching away of the saints, the gathering of his elect. He's, he's not mentioned it, not one time, through the whole chapter. And he gets to verse 29, and this is Jesus. Folks, if you won't accept what Jesus says, you have a problem. Jesus said immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then, right after this, shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Meaning they're going to see him in heaven, in the sky. It's going to be peeled back. Everybody's going to see him. There's no secret coming of Jesus. There's no secret snatching or catching away. Every eye will see him. It says the sign to appear, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Hide us from the face of the wrath of the Lamb, the one that sits on the throne. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Why? Why are the tribes of the earth going to mourn? They see him. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Still no rapture. And then... What do we see? And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now this is exactly what we see. The sixth seal, the sun goes dark. The moon does not give its light. The stars fall. Heaven is peeled back. The wicked men of the earth see Jesus. The rapture happens at the second coming of Christ. There's not a second coming that's secret and mysterious and we're snatched away and planes crash and, and uh, all that left behind nonsense. That is not the way it goes down. 
If, if, listen, if they're making a movie about it and putting Nicolas Cage in it, it ain't from God. All right. But let's go back to Revelation. Now go to Revelation 7. Because what follows in the book of Revelation? The sixth seal. What is the sixth, what is the sixth seal? Everybody? Sun goes dark. Moon doesn't give us light. Stars fall. Heavens open. Great earthquake. Every island, every mountain's moved. That's the sixth seal, right? Everybody agree? That's what it said? Revelation 6? Let's go into Revelation 7. Because we got the seventh seal. Everybody say, seventh seal. seal. Alright, so let me turn there. Revelation 7. Now I'm not going to get into the 144,000. Everybody keeps asking me to teach on the 144,000. You know why I won't do it? Because I don't know what they're for and I don't know what they're going to do. And anybody that says they do, speculate. Oh, those are going to be 144,000 evangelists. They're going to be here for the tribulation. How do you know that? The Bible doesn't say that. You're just making crap up. So I don't, I don't teach about it because I don't know. Oh, you mean you can say you don't know about it? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they are, who they are, what they represent, what they're going to do or what they're not going to do. You know why? Because the Bible doesn't tell me. All we know is that there are 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel and that they're Jews and obviously it says they're virgins. I don't know. Are they, could they be literal virgins? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to be. I don't know who they are. And you don't either. And don't send me any emails at anybody that you think you know who they are because you don't know. <laughs> I love to tell people, People ask me questions, and I say, I don't know. And no one does. Because you know, <laughs> the Bible doesn't tell us. When it happens, guess what? Then we'll know. There's just some things that are like that. When it happens, then we'll understand it. We're just doing our best here. Right? That's all we can do. I'm not going to make stuff up. All right. But after he seals these mysterious 144,000 Jews... He says this. Go down to verse 9. He says, And after this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations, kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and before the throne and, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? Whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their, their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he, he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them and they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light upon them nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So, end of story of the seals. What we see with the seals, we see it go through this progression, the six seals, sun goes dark, moon does not give its light, Jesus is coming, and all of a sudden, John says there was this great multitude in heaven of all kindreds and tongues and nations. And then if that's, con not con you know, if that's confusing to some people, then John was like, where did these come from? Now here's one for you, pre-trib folks. He says they came out of great tribulation. That means they were in it. You can't 
Get out of a room that you aren't in. I don't know. My brain just thinks that way, Patrick. I tell people all the time, you can't jump off a table you didn't climb up on, right? To me, it's simple. You say, okay, you mean that we're going to go through this whole thing then, Pastor Dean, don't you? <gasps> yes, I do. Unless you get martyred at some point before the end. Well, wait a bit. <laughs> what about the wrath of God? You going to tell me that God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, doesn't have it figured out who are his and who are not? And who to dump wrath on and who not to? Come on, folks. It's not complicated. He knows who are his. Now, he didn't promise we would be, we would go through and not have any tribulation or persecution. But when God starts pouring down his special wrath, like the hailstones, like the sores breaking out on the people with the mark of the beast. Notice, notice the first vial of wrath. You want to talk about the wrath of God? The first vial, sores break out, boils break out on people who took the mark of the beast. That wouldn't be Christians. So God puts a difference between the two. In the middle of the tribulation period, he managed to pour his wrath on just people who took the mark and not the ones who didn't. <gasps> Imagine that. Oh, but see, I'll get... Get off your high horse, Pastor Dean. No, you guys get off your false teaching. And maybe I'll get off my high horse then, right? God knows the difference. One of the vials of wrath is God pouring out darkness upon the seat or this, where the, the beast, the Antichrist, will have his, you know, his place of his dominion, his, his actual seat where he will have a, a throne and a kingdom or a, like a, you know, like, like our president has the White House. He's going to have his spot. I actually think I know where it is. He's going to rule from a place. And it says that one of those vials of wrath. Does that have anything to do with me or you? No. God brought darkness on Egypt. Guess what? In Goshen, where his people were, there was light. See, folks? When he, when he, when he killed the cattle, when God brought the plague and killed the cattle, the livestock of the Egyptians, guess what? The Israelites, the cattle was fine. And when the final plague of death, the death angel, comes in, those who obeyed and put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost who were in obedience and in faith, that death angel moved past their house and found the Egyptian who didn't believe and didn't obey. Folks, do you even believe Psalm 91? He says a thousand will fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it won't come near you. God will not bring his wrath upon you. If you're really his and you really love him and you're really walking with him, he will not bring his wrath. He doesn't say you won't suffer some of the devil's wrath. He says he won't bring his wrath upon you. Now let's look at the trumpets real quick. I'm not going to go through all this. I've got a video that's nearly two hours about the trumpets. I believe trumpet one was World War II. I, I mean, World War I, I believe trumpet number two was World War II. I believe trumpet number three was Chernobyl. I believe trumpet number four 
Was the sun going dark and being blocked out by the oil fields burning in the Middle East in the, in the Gulf War? I believe number five was the 2008 economic crisis that lasted for five months. I believe that was caused by demonic locusts out of the pit. Those weren't real locusts. They're demonic spirits that were loosed from the abyss. I don't have time to go through all that. The sixth trumpet is the next one to be blown. When will it be blown? I don't know. But the sixth trumpet is a war that kills one-third of mankind with fire. That's what's next in the trumpets. But I want to show you something about the trumpets. The seventh trumpet, and you can go to Revelation chapter 10, the seventh trumpet, or the last trumpet. <gasps> that sounds familiar. It ought to. Revelation 10, let's look at this. Remember the, the, remember the timeline I showed you a minute ago? The sixth seal? The seventh seal is just silence. But right after that sixth seal, when the sun goes dark and the moon does not give its light and the stars fall and the, and the heavens peel back, the solid dome skies peel back. When that happens and Jesus is sitting there, they see him. The next thing in Revelation we see was what? The great multitude in heaven. Where did these come from? They came out of the great tribulation. We got the similar situation and let's look at it. So you go through the trumpets, and I believe all five have been blown. I can prove it. You can believe it or not. I don't care. I can prove it. But you get to the sixth trumpet, and you get to the seventh trumpet. Now, look, notice what he says. This is Revelation 10, the seventh trumpet, or the last trumpet. In Revelation 10, verse 7, are you with me? Well, actually, we're going to read... <laughs> Actually, let's just read from verse 1. I'm sorry, Kevin. We can back up and read from verse 1. All right? Revelation 10, verse 7, because I want you to see. Because there's part of this seventh, this seventh trumpet angel. He's in Revelation 10 and he's in Revelation 11. All right, let's read about him because this last trumpet is important. And he says here, in verse 1, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire and he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right hand, foot uh, upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth and when he had cried seven thunders uttered their voices and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices I was about to write and I heard a voice from the heaven saying to me seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not you know the other day I get these questions some people ask me what are the seven thunders I don't know because guess what? They were sealed up and John wasn't allowed to tell us. I don't know. So anybody tells you what the seven thunders are, they're making up crap again. Okay? Because I don't know. You don't know. No one knows. Just a side note. All right? On that. Now let's keep going. Verse 5, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that uh, therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein. That, now listen to what he says here. This, this angel says that there should be time no longer. Now try to figure that one out. There shall be time no longer. What does that mean? I, know, I don't know, but I, I think that means we're, we're at the end here. Time's up. And then he says this, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, everybody read this with me, the mystery of God, come on, can I hear you? The mystery of God should be finished. Whoa. When the seventh angel sounds his trumpet, time's up. The mystery of God is finished. Meaning, there's nothing more to be revealed. There's nothing more to happen. That's it. He says the mystery of God is finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Does everybody see that? Now go to Revelation 11. Revelation 11. 
Are you in Revelation 11? All right, here we're going to read from, from verse uh, 15. Revelation 11, verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The seventh trumpet, the last trumpet, the mystery of God's finished. Everything he spoke to the prophets, finished. No more hidden, nothing. And then he says, the seventh angel sounds and he says, Whoa, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Now let's go to verse 16. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God and on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God. Let's keep going. Saying, um, Goodness, where are we? Saying that we give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry. And what happens at the seventh trumpet? And thy wrath is come. And everybody read this with me. And the time of the dead. What, what dead? What time of the dead? The rapture, the resurrection, the first resurrection. I'll show you that in a second. He said, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them that destroy the earth. When does the time of the dead, I believe this is talking about the righteous dead, because he said, to give reward unto your servants, He's talking about the rapture at the seventh trumpet or the last trumpet. Everybody see that? And then he's going to destroy them that destroy the earth. Let me give you a little hint before we proceed. The Bible says in Luke chapter 17, when Jesus was saying that when his coming is going to be like the days of, of Lot, he says the same day Everybody say this with me. The same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone and destroyed them all. So Jesus is talking about his second coming. He says the same day we go out is the great day. It's the last day. And it is the great day of God's wrath. And that is the day that every island's moved, every mountain moved. The hellstones rain down. God rains fire out of heaven and he destroys everyone whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. It's the day all the cities of the nations fall. The great day of his wrath. We are taken out the same day and then the great day of his wrath comes down upon the world. It is one day. And this is confirmed by Jesus. Four times in John 6, Jesus says to those who believe, those who are the righteous, those who are walking with him, he says, I will raise him up at the last day. And the Apostle Paul, go to 1 Corinthians 15, 51. The Apostle Paul Remember, the seventh angel, he says, guess what? The mystery of God is finished. The mystery's finished. What mystery? I love this. What mystery is he talking about at the last trumpet? Well, Paul gave a hint, but a number of years before John wrote the book of Revelation, he gave a little, he gave a little teaser, a little trailer Paul wrote here, he said, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So Paul said, I'm going to show you, I'm showing you a mystery. I'm revealing something. What was he revealing? He wasn't revealing that the righteous are going to be resurrected. That was taught throughout the Bible. That wasn't a mystery. 
He was giving you a hint as to the timing of the rapture or the, the first resurrection. He let you know something that hadn't been known before that it's going to happen at the last trumpet. This is before we got the book of Revelation. So about 30 years later or so, give or take a few years, John's on the Isle of Patmos and God gives him the vision, the open vision, calls him up to heaven and shows him everything that's going to happen. That's the book of Revelation. And, and John gives us these seven trumpets that nobody knew about before that were going to happen. And at the last trumpet, he says, the mystery is finished. The time of the dead has happened now to give reward to my servants. Everybody see that? Now, if that were not enough, we got a little bit more to do here. We're going to look at, let's look at the six vials of wrath. Revelation chapter 16. Somebody say, oh. Say amen or oh me. Which is it? Amen or oh me? <laughs> Watch it. Watch it there. Don't make me call your name out. All right, Revelation chapter 16. Now let's look at this. Remember I said the vials of wrath? They're the third story of judgment, of the final judgment. Remember the other day I said, I made a statement in one of my messages. I said that seven is the number of, of judgment, completed judgment. Somebody came back and go, oh, no, it's not. That's the number of perfection. Where are you getting that from? I said, well, there's seven seals and there's seven trumpets of judgment and there's seven vials of wrath. I just kind of assumed it had something to do with judgment. The judgment of God being finished. He's the one that picked seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials of wrath. I didn't pick that. So, you know, some people get bent out of shape over some silly things. Here we go. 16, Revelation 16, verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became his blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became his blood. Now remember, these judgments happened in, in Egypt. This judgment of the blood, the, the waters being turned to blood, happened in Egypt. The fish in the river died. Yet, the Israelites survived until it was over. Let's keep going. Verse 5, And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt... Uh, shalt be because thou hast judged us for they have shed the blood of saints and of prophets and thou hast given them blood to drink for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say even so Lord God Almighty true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Now notice the sun here is still there. It's not gone dark, right? So this is not the second coming. This is just a judgment where God moves upon the sun specifically to scorch those who blaspheme. That wouldn't be Christians, I would hope, right? If you're a Christian blaspheming, we got a problem. And men were scorched with the great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their swords and repented not of their deeds. Now, they didn't repent of their deeds, I think, for maybe a couple of reasons here. Number one, they'd already taken the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. So there's no hope at that point. Once you do that, it's over. There's no hope for forgiveness. Also, you, you probably cross a line and it does something to you spiritually and maybe even physically to the point where you cannot. You, you are given over to a reprobate mind. You you. You, you, don't, you don't want to repent, no matter what happens. Don't go that far. And then he gets to the sixth angel. So here we're at the sixth vial of wrath 
almost at the very end of everything. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God. Everybody say great day. Great day. See, people have talked about the day of the Lord as if it's the whole seven years is the day of the Lord. That's not true. The day of the Lord is a day. It's a day. It's a battle. It's a day of great judgment. And so these unclean spirits go out of the mouth of the beast and the false prophet and Satan, the dragon. And they gather together the whole world to battle, to come to battle. Who are they coming to battle? They're going to come battle Jesus. Look at verse 15. This is the Lord speaking. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into the place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So here's the sixth vial. He's drawing the kingdoms of the earth, the kings and the armies of the earth, to the battle of Armageddon, the valley of Megiddo in Israel. Now here we are, the seventh angel. Everybody say this with me. Seventh angel. Seventh, angel. seventh, vial, of wrath. seventh vial of wrath. Let's read what he says. Verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. Now let me start right there. What did we see happened at the seventh trumpet? He said what? The mystery of God's finished. We're done. Time is no more. Here at the seventh vial of wrath, what does he say? It is done. It's finished. Do you see how these are the same, these things happen at the same time? And he says, look what he says. He says in the, verse 18, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great earthquake. Where do we read that? <gasps> the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. Right? He says there was a great earthquake. So mighty an earthquake and so great. Was, it was not since men were upon the earth. And then he says, verse 19, and the great city was divided into three parts. That is Jerusalem. And then he says, and the cities of the nations fell. Everybody, you know, again, we read over this. The cities of the nations fell. Me, right there. Every single city, wicked city across the entire world crumbled that day. Why do you think it's called the great day of God's wrath? He is wiping the earth clean of the wicked and everything they built. He's going to destroy them all. And he says, look at this. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon, which I believe is Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, Rome, came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Look at verse 20. And every island fled away, and, every, and, and the mountains were not found. Where did we see that before? Kevin, put up Re Re Revelation 6 real quick. The sixth seal. What do we see? Go back to the sixth seal. And the heaven departed as a scroll. Revelation 6, 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Do you see? Sixth seal. Seventh vial of wrath. Same event. Same day. Pastor Dean, when do we get out of here? Let's keep reading. Verse 20. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of hell, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Now, let me stop real quick. We're almost done. Listen to me. So you see the seventh vial of wrath. That's the end. It is done, he says. The great city of Rome destroyed. All the cities of the nations fall. Every island, every mountain's moved. That's exact. Six 
the sixth seal, that's the same thing happened. The seventh trumpet is the same thing. The seventh vial of wrath. Now, Revelation 17 and 18 reveal who the great whore mystery Babylon is. We're going to cover that. It is the Roman Catholic Church. and I, All this stuff, it's Saudi Arabia, it's America. No, it's not. We'll deal with that thoroughly in the days ahead. But hear me. Revelation 17 and 18 is like a parenthetical statement. It's just, it, it, it kind of pauses in the middle of everything, gives you two chapters to identify the great whore mystery Babylon. But really, from verse six, from uh, Revelation 16, picks up in, verse, uh, in chapter 19. Because what do we see? The end of Revelation 16, we see the great whore mystery Babylon being destroyed. And then Revelation 19 picks up talking about her being destroyed. Well, look at the, the end of chapter 18. Go to chapter 18, verse 18. He's talking about the judgment of Mystery Babylon. And he says this, and, and the people cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what, what city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust upon their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein was made rich all that had ships in the, in the sea and by reason of the coastlines, for it was in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Now I want to say this. There are people that talk about the United States being mystery Babylon. Who killed the prophets and the apostles, of, the original apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he has said, I'm, I've now avenged the blood of my apostles and prophets. It was Rome. It was Rome. It was not America. America didn't exist. It was Rome, the city of Rome. And he goes on. He says, verse 20 again, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman and whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound there of a millstone shall be heard no more at all. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So he's talking about the judgment of the great whore mystery Babylon. And her agents, the Jesuits, that have had their hands in every government of the world in helping to, to create Islam and not the Nazis and the communists, everything we can trace back to Rome. But look at verse 19. I mean, chapter 19, verse 1. When is the bride made ready? Again, the timing. When do we see the bride getting her white robe? Here we go, her white clothing. Revelation 19. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore. That's Mystery Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication. That word means idolatry. And hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again, they said, Hallelujah, and the smoke and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And the voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. Here's this multitude again. I heard this great multitude. As the voice of many waters, as the voice of mighty thunder, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And why? Why are they rejoicing? Look at verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come. When does the marriage of the lamb happen? After the judgment 
of the great whore. When does the judgment of the great whore happen? At the seventh vial of wrath and the seventh trumpet or the last trumpet, which is when we are changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. He says, the bride, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready and to her was granted that she, she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Now what follows that? See, see let, me, let me break it down for you before we read verse 11. Let me break it down. Boom, the sun goes dark. The moon doesn't give it light. The stars fall from the firmament. The firmament begins to crack open and move back. The firmament, I believe, parts of it are the, the hail that comes down and begins to crush and destroy. The kings and the wicked of the earth see the Lord Jesus sitting upon his throne and beginning to descend. They say, hide us from the face and the wrath of the Lamb. These things began to happen. So the seventh, the seventh trumpet sounds. The mystery of God is finished. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, as, as the sixth trumpet or the sixth vial is gathering, the armies of the world are gathering to the land of Israel to fight Jesus. Because they see him. They're, they're gathering to fight. And they see him. He says the seventh trumpet sounds. He says, time is no more. It's finished. It's done. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're changed. The dead in Christ are raised up. We which are alive and remain are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. It's in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. It's not going to take weeks or years. Boom, we are changed. We are with the Lord in the air. The seventh seal says there's 30 minutes of silence. I believe that is when we have in heaven with the Lord, we have a moment with him. We get our white robes. We get our rewards. Remember, he said time is no longer. So time is irrelevant at this point. We could be in heaven to what us seems like a, 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 a year, and it could be five minutes on earth. But the next thing you see after the judgment of the great whore, and you see the lamb. The, the, the marriage of the lamb has come. The bride is there. She gets her white, rent, her white clothing. We get our rewards. The next thing you see, and I saw heaven open and a white horse. Verse 11. And he that sat upon him was called, <clears throat> was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And, and, and he treadeth the winepress, of the wrath and the fierceness of, and the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Folks, that is how the Bible plays it out. Not Pastor Dean. That's how the Bible plays it out. There's no pre tribulation rapture. That is a myth. That is a doctrine created by men. We are here. And, and I just want to say a little word for the pre-wrath people out there. Because I've got some of them that torment me as well. I have the sign by uh, Van Campen. I've read the rapture question. I have Rosenthal's book. I've read all of it. Okay? Pre-wrath theory is pre-trib light. That's all it is. It is no more biblical than, than the pre-trib view. Because it still tries to break these things up in 
seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials happening one after the other. And it's just not the way it works. Now, folks, I don't know about you. You say, well, Pastor Dean, this scares me. Well, hopefully if it scares you, it scares you enough to get you, get you right with God, right? But it doesn't scare me. You know why? I get excited. I'm ready to see what God's going to do through his people. Because, you know, the book of Daniel chapter 11 says that these things are going to come on the world. And he says, but the Lord, the Lord's people, he said, will be strong and do exploits. Isaiah 60 says, darkness is going to come upon the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord will arise upon his people. He said, my glory will be seen. I'm going to tell you, how many of you know that you see a flashlight or a candle better when the lights go out? The darker it gets, the more evident the light becomes. See, that's what's going to happen with the church. Jesus prayed. Folks, Jesus prayed. The prayer of Jesus. Y'all want to hear it? John 17. Here's what he prayed. John 17, 15. Jesus said, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world but that thou shouldest keep them from me. Now that's the prayer of Jesus and men came up with a doctrine that God's going to come around here and sneaky take us away at the end. That's not what Jesus prayed, is it? I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. Listen to the voice of Paul, what he said here. You know, as Christians... We should want to be here as long as possible in order to win as many people to Jesus as we can. Why would we want to leave them? Paul said this. He said, I am in a strait betwixt the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Philippians 1, 23 and 24. Paul said, yeah, I would love to go and be with Christ. That is far better than this life and this world. He said, but for me to abide here in the flesh is more needful for you. Why was he? He said, it's more needful for me to be here to train and to teach believers and to lead unsaved people to know Jesus. That's more important than getting out of here. People, the, the next one, the next pre-tribber that accuses me of pride, I'm going to say there's nothing more prideful than say, I'm getting out of here, but you wicked people are going to have to stay. You arrogant person. You should want to stay here and be a light to them even if you have to suffer. See, that is really the key to this. Isn't it? We don't want to suffer anymore. We don't want any difficulty. We don't want any persecution. We don't want any trouble. We want everything to be wonderful and sweet and prosperous and successful and your best life now. That's what we want. Every day of Friday, as Joel says. All smiles and giggles. It's just not the way it is. So folks, there's no pre-tribulation rapture. There's no mid-tribulation rapture. There is no pre-wrath somewhere in the fourth or fifth year rapture. It's at the last day, the last trumpet, the end. At the second coming, not the third coming. And you know what? I know. I know they're going to try to kill me before then. But I hope I get to I hope I get to see it all. I hope I'm standing there on the day 
the final trumpet blows and I'm still alive. I hope so. Not because I don't, I don't mind being martyred. But I hope I get to see it from this perspective. Because there's never going to be another day quite like it. The great day of God Almighty's wrath is coming. Are you ready? That's the question. A lot of people think they're ready. And I'm going to end with this. There are a lot of people out there. A lot of people. That would tell you, I believe in Jesus. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. I believe that he rose from the dead. They go to church or they listen to sermons and videos. And, but they've never been born again. You know, I had a little conversation with a 32nd degree Mason the other day. And we had a long discussion because he had walked away from God and became a Mason. He got very, very high up in the Masons. But, you know, as we started talking, of course, the curses, the, the, the curses are upon him. The demonic forces are just tormenting and vexing him from all the oaths and rituals and things he participated in. And he knows it. And of course, no one's talked to him about deliverance until he called me. So I talked to him about deliverance. But, you know, I don't assume anything anymore. Because he's sitting there talking about, hey, he believed in Jesus and all this stuff. And I said, you know, I said, before we go any further in this conversation, I gotta ask you this. I know you tell me you believe in Jesus. I know you tell me you believe he... He died for your sins on the cross. That he rose from the dead. You say you believe the Bible. You say you would die for Jesus. You'd be a martyr. That's all commendable. But was there ever a day, was there ever a moment that you asked Jesus to come in and be Lord of your life, to forgive your sins, and you really meant business that you were going to give him everything, total surrender, turn from your sin and become a true disciple and that was so real that was so genuine and sincere that the Holy Spirit came in you and upon you and immediately bore witness that your sins were forgiven that you were born again that you were a child of God I said did you ever have a supernatural experience called being born again folks there are a lot of people who are believers of Jesus in their head and they've never, ever been born again. And folks, let me tell you, if you haven't been hit by the presence and power and peace and love of God through the Holy Spirit when you accepted Jesus, you might have prayed a sinner's prayer, but that didn't mean you were born again. There's a lot of people that's prayed a sinner's prayer, and I don't have a problem with it. If you can say, I truly surrendered, I truly repented, I truly gave my whole life, I'm holding nothing back, everything's yours, Lord. And you felt the peace and love of God. The, as, as the old hymn used to say, the blessed assurance that you know that you know in your knower that you were born again through faith in Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Ghost. If you've never had that supernatural experience, I don't care how many times you've been to church, I don't care how many times you've prayed a sinner's prayer, I don't care how many times you've been baptized, sprinkled, or whatever. I don't care how many sermons you've listened, how much Bible you've studied, I don't care. If you haven't been born again, supernatural encounter with Jesus, Holy Spirit bearing full witness, that you are a child of God. Let me tell you folks, when, when I was born again, I couldn't hold back the tears. I couldn't hold back the shaking. I couldn't hold back the overwhelming encounter with Jesus Christ. 
If you haven't had that, I'm going to tell you, you better find it. You better seek until you find. And the reason, I'm going to say this, the reason a lot of people are, are, are come forward in a church service or, or uh, pray with a TV preacher or whatever, the re a lot of people will do that because they feel guilty over their sin, but they don't really mean to surrender their own will, their own plans, their whole life. They don't really mean to give up. They want fire insurance, but they don't want Jesus to be Lord. They want forgiveness, but they don't want lordship. And you can't be saved. Until you say, Lord, I will do whatever you want me to do. I give up doing it my own way. So many people have never, ever truly surrendered their will. You go from being your own boss. See, People wonder, they, how, how, Pastor Dean, you didn't, you didn't go to seminary. You didn't do this. You didn't, you didn't do it their way. You're right, I didn't. God wouldn't let me do it that way. Let me tell you what happened to me. I said, God, I'll, wa I'll walk away from it all. All my plans. Modeling career, movie career, doctor, playing football, Sexual immorality, the desire to be rich and famous. I know it was all right there in my hands. It was all right there. I could have had, I could have had it every bit of it. But you know what I said? Lord, that's it. I'm done. From this point. I remember June, June 1987, I said, that's it. I'm done. My life is yours, God, whatever you have me to do. And I want to tell you, did he ever come back in and fill me with his Holy Spirit and begin to do amazing things in my life? But I wouldn't be here today teaching, preaching, or doing any of this if I hadn't made that decision. Let me tell you, a lot of Sunday mornings, I want to stay in bed too. You know why I don't? Because God wants me to feed his sheep. Amen? The reason I get stressed out sometimes, it's not because I can't get up and preach a sermon. I can get up and preach on anything. But I don't want to do that. I want to know what God wants me to preach on. So I'm stressing and trying to break through my flesh and my tiredness or all kind of different stuff. I'm trying to break through that so I make sure I'm getting what he wants me to talk about that day to that group of people. And I can just tell you the devil doesn't like it. And I want to say this for all those people out there. I don't think I'm anything. Trust me. I struggle with sin. I struggle with temptation. I struggle with my mind. I struggle with all kind of worries and concerns. And I struggle. There's days, my wife will tell you, I would just rather just go crawl into, under a rock and disappear. I know. I look. I can tell you right now, in this flesh, in me, dwells no good thing. Nothing. Nothing. Everything I have, every ability I have to teach or preach, everything is, is what God has given me, and sometimes I don't even want it. Because the responsibility and the weight of it is almost too much. So, I just want to say that to people out there. I, look, I'm not perfect. I don't get everything right. I just try my best. I hope you do the same. Okay. Yes. Let's stand.
Folks, we are, we are nothing without the blood of Jesus washing our sins away. We are nothing, we have nothing unless truly the Holy Spirit gives it to us and works it through us. You can try with all your might and strength to do something for God, but if he didn't call you to do it or tell you to do it, it's just flesh. The key to everything, make sure you're born again. You're truly born again. Jesus is Lord of your life. Get filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues and start operating the gifts. Spend time in prayer and the Word of God and learn to hear His voice and discern what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. And then when He tells you to do something and leads you to do something, you do it. That's Christianity. If he tells you to shut your mouth, shut your mouth. If he tells you to speak, speak. If he tells you to go over there, go over there. If he tells you to stay and wait, stay and wait. And if it's written in the Bible, you know, and, and if I hear one more person tell me, it doesn't matter when the, when the rapture is. Well, my God, I guess it, God shouldn't have put it in there, in the book. No, all truth matters. Trust me, it's going to matter a whole lot in the very near future. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you are merciful and patient. Lord, all of us, Lord, we're blinded, deceived, rebellious, doing our own thing, living in sin, unbelief, self-will. But Lord, you convicted us, you broke us, you drew us, those of us that are saved and born again, you, you did it, and we finally yielded. But we have to keep yielding. Lord, I pray that people out there that have been watching or listening to this, Lord, if they've never been born again, that they will truly surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior. And it'll be so thorough and complete and real that your Holy Spirit will bear witness and that they will be born again. Lord, I pray that. I pray that for people more than anything else. That they will know that they're saved. They will know your presence. They will know your voice. They will know you and love you and want to do things your way. Lord, I pray this in, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, that's all I have. I'm going to end that with that today. Y'all hug some necks before you leave. Amen. Love y'all.